Hey guys, before we start the show, I want to talk directly to all the youth sports leaders out there. Have you ever had to get creative with how you handle replacing a lost jersey or help that new kid get a uniform well past the ordering window? Are you tired of handing out gear, managing orders, and stashing boxes in the basement? Hey, Squad Locker's here to change the game for you. Through our custom online store, you can offer a mix of custom sublimated, printed, and embroidered uniforms, plus team gear and spirit wear, all in one spot. Your always open store can serve coaches, players, parents, and fans directly and on demand, allowing for a seamless process from preseason to your championship run. Check out squadlocker.com forward slash suit up. That's squadlocker.com forward slash suit up to learn more. And now, on with the show. listening to On The Whistle, the podcast that explores the impact that coaches, teachers, and mentors from youth sports organizations and schools have on young people's lives. Here's our host and Squad Locker CEO, Gary Goldberg. Hello, everybody, and welcome to another episode of On The Whistle, uh, where I've got my trusty co-pilot Max sitting next to me, and I'm excited to introduce Sarah Albus. Sarah is the co-founder and executive director of Open Door Sports. Um, Aside from being an accomplished soccer player herself, who played uh, D1 soccer at Vanderbilt and was a member of the U.S. national soccer team, Sarah has uh, started on her own and has a very successful nonprofit that looks to serve uh, children who are either f- uh, financially um, incapable or incapable of affording a program in their city or a child that may have some physical disability and is looking to just simply get out and play. And uh, the quote that I've read on her, on her website, which is a, a very, very powerful quote, is giving all children, regardless of perceived ability or financial status, the opportunity to play. And uh, for those of you who listen to our show, we know how important it is to have mentors, teachers, coaches, helping young people reach their maximum and full potential. And it's the get- dedication of people like Sarah that, that make that happen. So Sarah, we're excited to have you on today to talk about Open Door Sports and uh, the history of it and your role. Thank you. Happy to be here. Yeah. So before we get into Open Door Sports, I'd love to know a little bit about you and soccer. Were you a super sporty kid growing up that just loved to be out and play? You went to Vanderbilt, so either you were a really, really good player and an average student or a good student and a good player because <laughs> Vanderbilt's a tough school to get into. So um, just tell me a little bit about you growing up. Um, yeah, I I loved, I think, every sport. Um, from an early age, started playing soccer when I was uh, about four. Um, first game scored on my own team because I passed the ball back to my goalie and it went through their legs. Um, so I always tell my kids that because they, some of them are a little bit afraid of uh, messing up. But yeah, no, my mom, um, both of my parents, my dad played football and basketball in college. My mom played field hockey and basketball in college. And um, we just, you know, they introduced me and I just, uh, I kind of loved everything. Um and I remember my mom once telling me that some of her friends were saying that, you know, you put her in too much, she's going to get burnt out. But I never remember that feeling. And I think maybe because it was a time um, in the 80s and early 90s where variety was still something that, you know, uh, good athletes had available, right? So, you know, being a three-sport varsity athlete was sort of that badge of honor uh, for those of us who – who did it. Um, and I know now it's not as much of a thing, um, for higher level athletes to do, but no, I loved it all from gymnastics and ice skating and volleyball and downhill skiing, played basketball and in, in uh, high school ran track. Um, so yeah, always pretty sporty. Um, I was a cheerleader for one year, sixth grade. So, but that's, uh, tried it all. Sarah, when you when you think back about growing up and your experience uh, playing sports or cheerleading or any of these activities, um, mm-hmm. 
Were there particular coaches or was there a particular coach or mentor that kind of set you in your way and helped you find uh, that skill that was inside you and bring it, bring it to life? Um, you know, I, I really lucked out. Um, I, I can't pinpoint like one coach that sort of changed my trajectory. Um, my parents, like my mom was one of my coaches for early years. Um, but they all, you know, from, from team to team and like a, a lot of, um, you know, what I, what I really enjoyed is that, you know, you had a coach, um, you just stayed on a team for a number of years. It kind of became like a family, um, which I think, you know, the coaches were awesome. Um, some of them were, you know, ex-professional players. We had some English coaches, but it was at a time where most of the coaches were parents, right? It wasn't this sort of paid dynamic. Um, but you know, when you're on a team and you're, it's like you're, you don't have to compete to be on the team anymore. And that was the part I think of, of growing up playing uh, back then that I thought helped me the most because you, what's, what was great then is you were on a team, you weren't trying out every year, you know, like maybe you would make the choice as a player to go somewhere else. Or I know that my, um, a good chunk of my team, almost my whole team, um, moved to a different club, but we all sort of did it together um, at one point, probably in late middle school to early high school. But, you know, we, the coaches were all great and encouraging, but there wasn't that sort of um, feeling of, okay, I made the team and then it takes you a while to get comfortable and then you're trying out again, which is, I feel like watching my own children play and doing, you know, playing travel and club soccer, that it was like they only got comfortable and then they had to try out again, you know, um, which I think is something that was a total benefit to me because I just, I was at ease. I was able to build confidence, build skills, wasn't always concerned about that part. Um, but I have to say, like we, the coaches that I had were all great, but there wasn't anybody who was necessarily like, um, you know, changed my path so much. Let's jump a, a little bit into open door sports. So <clears throat> after college and post this uh, nat U.S. national soccer team experience, you become married and have children. And yes. I know in some of the research I did that there's this term neurotypical kid, yeah, which I heard you say in one of your interviews. And I believe you had one child who's not neurotypical. And was, yeah. was that some of, tell, tell me a little bit about that. And was that some of the impetus around open door sports? How did yeah. you, how'd you come up with the, the idea of it? Um, so, yes. Yeah, so we have, my husband, Mark and I have four daughters. Um, there, there's only a three and a half year spread between all four. So it's a busy <laughs> so time. One and 18 months later, we had another. And then two years later, uh, we had twins and the twins, um, came very, very early, like 25 weeks. And, um, Libby or Elizabeth had a sort of typical stay for a 25 week or was in the hospital for, for three months, but they were both born at about a pound and a half, um, which is like the size of your hand. Um, and anyone, my husband could take his wedding ring and put it all the way over their shoulder and not touch any, they were the tiniest little things. Um, Hannah had, was sick, uh, had gotten my sack, had gotten infected. She was born early. She went through um, just a lot. She had a bad brain bleed, six brain surgeries. Um, and, you know, we, that was just a, a very monumental part of our family dynamic, our relationship as a couple. Um, we were once told that, um, people who go through that intense NICU experience, you know, either fall apart or get stronger. And we, we tended to be that, like, you know, balance each other out when someone else was on the low. Cause it was, you know, Hannah was in the hospital for full six months, like 186 days. Um, and, uh, and yet, you know, she comes home, she's like the happiest kid and just, 
had that um, right from the get go, like just a determination, you know, and as she grew and um, her twin, you know, their PT and OT and intensive therapies, um, we, you know, we were told early on she would be uh, a very high risk for cerebral palsy. So mo- I didn't know this before having them, but CP is a cumulative diagnosis that comes at about 18 months of age. Um, and there's factors that you have to have. So you have to have a brain bleed at or around birth. Um, and then you have to be delayed really significantly in all of the movement um, milestones. So it's, that's why it always seems to happen at 18 months um, where you're like, okay, yeah, they had a traumatic birth or they had a bleed, which Hannah had a bleed three days after she was born. And then, you know, you realize 18 months later, okay, they're not, you know, they're just not rolling over at the same rate or they can't come to sit or some of those things. So, but she always like, even as a baby, she just was like this really determined, um, determined kid where, you know, her twin sister, um, was just a, a softer child. So you like, you know, like just very empathetic and, and but worried and you couldn't push her outside of her zone. And with Hannah, you could push her and push her and push her and she would giggle, 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 then cry, you know? So like for that kind of situation where you're, you're fighting to crawl, you're fighting to weight bear on your legs and, you know, walking and all of these things. It was like her personality, um, from the beginning was like, we thanked our lucky stars that she was wired the way that she was. So she obviously had, um, a huge, I mean, she was, she was our inspiration for starting ODS and it wasn't because she wasn't doing things. Um, you know, she was a kid who early on, we, um, I can't remember how old they were, maybe, maybe five, the twins were maybe five, seven and nine. And I'm from Michigan originally. And I said to my husband, I'm like, the kids need to know how to ski. So we go off up to somewhere, Liberty, somewhere in, in Pennsylvania to ski. And I put, you know, the other three girls in, in ski lessons. And I said to Mark, I was like, all right, well, we'll just swap out you know, um, and one of us can sit with Hannah and, and for, and then the other skis and we'll just switch. And we're staying in the, like the rental ski line. And she starts pulling on my, my snow pants says, mom, where are my skis? Where are my skis? And I was like, like, that's, that was the moment where I'm like, I'm not, I'm not going to just have her sit on the sidelines. Like all of her sisters do you know, various sports from an early age, they tried everything. And it was the first time where I was like, holy cow, I can't, I have to find an option. And sure enough, there was, you know, adapted skiing and she totally took to it and loved it. And we tried that. And then she did horseback riding and then we found ballet lessons and, uh, she would do, um, she did special Olympic soccer, um, and basketball, uh, for soccer, you know, Hannah loved it all. My perspective and part of how ODS started was um, just feeling like, you know, that that we don't want to sell these kids short or think that they don't have the potential to, to learn the game. Um, and so much of that comes from, you know, us seeing potential in Hannah when there were some people who sort of wrote her off and thought like, okay, she's never going to be able to walk or she's never going to be able to talk. Um, And we just kept fighting and kept trying to find um, the right therapists and the right doctors who saw the potential. So for me, I was like, well, I, you know, in thinking of what wasn't available to kids um, with special needs, and like I said, Hannah did a a plethora of of things, nothing, she was never able to stay after school. Um, And at least where we live, after school activities, enrichment activities, there's tons, you know, it can be, you know, arts, it can be Legos, it can be science driven STEM, you know, and sports. Um, and so when I started thinking about starting ODS, I was like, you know, that was one piece of the, the pie that I thought we could fill. You know, there are a number of, of amazing organizations that do stuff on weekends. Um, 
there's a handful of groups that do art stuff. Um, but I was like, you know what? I'm like, I don't, I don't know of any after school sports organization specifically for kids with disabilities. So that was how ODS started. And it definitely was driven from, from Hannah. And, you know, she, she asked about that, like, you know, where's Libby or where's Catherine, you know, where are my sisters? I'm like, Oh, they stayed after school to do something. She's like, well, why can't I do that? You know? So, um, that's how it started. And, um, and I felt like in doing this, having the experience as a player and having, you know, I had coached from, you know, college age and then off and on up, um, at pretty high levels of, of my kids with my kids, my, uh, with Catherine, especially my eldest, um, I felt like, you know what, like we can structure these, these programs so that we're actually teaching skills. Like we are going to teach them how to dribble the ball. We're going to teach them how to trap. What part of the foot do you use? And it may be, you know, a slower um, progression or need more repetition. Um, But I felt like, let's see the potential in these kids. And they, they continue to blow me away with what they, what they can do. So. There's a a quote um, on your website. I think it's at the end of a video or, or somewhere on there. It says opening eyes to the benefits of inclusion and the beauty in diversity. Yeah. Um, Yeah. How important is the idea of inclusion and diversity at ODS and what role does it play? Well, I, I think it is just, I think it's all, it's just everywhere with us. It's, it's all of what we do. Um, so the way that uh, ODS is structured is that we, um, we have players who have a variety of special needs or disabilities, um, kids with autism, Down syndrome, uh, cerebral palsy, intellectual disabilities, learning disorders. Um, it runs a gamut. And I um, really like to live up to the name of having open doors. Um, I know there's some programs out there that don't like to have kids who have physical disabilities involved with kids who don't. And the beauty of being a small organization and running it is that I get to be in control of that decision. Um, And, you know, so we're, we are inclusive of everyone Um, and it's worked and it's worked um, really, really well. Um, We also in our area, um, which I think is probably common in a lot of areas throughout the country is that our middle and high schoolers, you have, there's a a service learning component to your graduation. So um, if you're going to graduate from the County um, here where we live, uh, you have to have accumulated, you know, 75, they call them SSL student service learning hours. So uh, as the very early stages of this process, um, You have to get approval through the county and go through some training. But we have volunteer middle and high school peer buddies who come and help our players. And it's traditionally in a non-COVID period, we usually would have at least two peer buddies per player. Um, But we always have one-to-one, which takes out a lot of that concern, especially for me as a coach, um, that I can make sure everybody is safe, make sure that, you know, they have someone with them, that the peer buddies are always looking out for them. Um, some of our players have behaviors where they kind of, you know, will wander a little bit and it's, it's, it makes things run a, a lot more smoothly that I know that they're there to keep them safe and keep them protected. Um, but you know, the friendships that develop, I think it was a part of ODS that I, wasn't planning for or expecting. Um, I set out to make a a program for kids with disabilities to be able to play, get off the sidelines, get out there, be healthy, you know, be able to play, stay after school and just feel like they're a part of something in a, in a real encouraging and supportive environment. And the peer buddies were a a necessity for me. Um, But I didn't foresee the relationships, the impact on the peer buddies, the, um, the kids that come back season after season, year after year, develop friendships with these players, reach out to the parents after and say like, hey, can I, you know, take James to the library after soccer on Friday? 
you know, it grew beyond what I was planning. Um, and as you talk about, you know, inclusion and diversity, you know, our world, you know, we all don't look the same. We don't walk the same or talk the same. And for me, I started to see it as a evolution of our community where these kids who are in middle school and high school now, you know, see, you know, one of our players in the hallway at school and would, you know, reach out and say hi or give them a high five or talk to them. And these kids would not have otherwise generally interacted or gotten to know each other. So then to me, that means like, okay, the next time that they're somewhere in their life and they see someone with a disability or who might have a behavior that isn't typical, um, that they might understand it and have some compassion. And, and, um, you know, when you care for someone else, it just makes the world a better place. Yeah. It really brings down those walls. It was, um, for me, super impactful. And on a personal note, you know, Hannah started at our uh, middle school and Tilden was one of that, um, her elementary school where she no longer was, was the first school I went to. And then there was a chunk of schools after that. Uh, her middle school was one of those where she was uh, a student and, you know, we started there and it was great. And as we grew, um, you know, I would have another coach there and be somewhere else, um, you know, starting a new program. Uh, but she ended up developing this relationship with a, you know, another seventh grade girl gets invited to the girl's birthday party at the mall. And it it was like, you know, I think for, for a lot of parents, it wouldn't be a big deal, but like, this was the first time, like she, she had never been invited to a 13 year old's birthday party, you know, and Hannah has, has friends, but everything is more challenging, right? It's, it's, um, you know, the development of friends really didn't come till I would say probably middle school when they were, you know, all of the people, the kids that she was in class were just were developmentally, you know, had grown, but she hadn't had a relationship like this with um, just a, a, a neurotypical student at school. And the student asked her to come over on a Friday night, you know, and hang out. And I went over and talked to the mom and they went off and played music and, so to me, it was like this aha moment of, okay, you know, like this, um, this isn't just about being healthy and getting to play a sport. It's become, um, you know, in our little area is definitely become, um, like, Hey, we're creating friendships. These people, these kids care about each other and that's going to matter as they move on. Um, and it's going to impact, you know, how they treat other people, um, you know, I, they won't stare, which happens, you know, I, I've always been that mom where, you know, you catch someone <laughs> staring and I would always say like, do you have a question about Hannah? You know, mm. and half the time they would say no and half the time they'd say yes. But I always sort of had to fill in with, you know, um, you know, she may walk differently and talk differently, but you know, she understands everything you're saying and feels the same way that you feel. Um, and I think, and what is the reaction typically when you say that? The kid's not. You know, I've never had, I've never had a um, a child be disrespectful back to me with mm-hmm. that. Most of them like okay, and then sometimes, especially the younger ones, will ask follow up questions. Yeah. Um, Young ones can be cute in that way. Yes. Yeah. They're like, well, what you know, yeah. what are those things in her shoes? I'm like, well, those are her orthotics, and they help her walk, and. Um, and it's funny because my, my eldest daughter actually wrote one of her, you know, college uh, essays about one of those instances at the movies, you know, uh, where there were a couple teenagers behind kind of whispering, you know, about Hannah. And Hannah doesn't like, you know, it's, it's, it's a blessing. She, you know, she didn't pick up on that stuff at the time. But Catherine being however old she was, probably 13 or so. She said she was like mortified that I was like, Hey ladies, you know, can I answer any questions that you might have about Hannah? And they were like, mm, you know, kind of been like caught in the act. Um, but it was one of those moments that Catherine, you know, like I think it shaped her too, like being like, okay, that's really cool. That my mom did that. And 
you know, wow, Hannah really is, you know, she is different. And, um, you know, and society isn't always kind. And I think for her, it was a, you know, a little bit of a, an aha moment on that end too. But Hannah sounds like a remarkably powerful person in the fact that as a result of her presence, all of these connections are being made and these communities are being shaped for the mere fact that she is who she is, which is a remarkable thing. The peer buddy piece sounds Mm -hmm. super important and super powerful. Is there a process that you go through to thoughtfully approach the matching piece or is it just like, or everybody getting a circle and pair off, you know, you're all in the same age or do you kind of like, take the Harry Potter approach and like try and put them in the different houses knowing this kid yes. seems quiet. This kid's loud. Like, how right. do you think through that? Um, you know, when we, when I first started and I went out to the first school, like it has been a learning process and I feel like every season I'm learning something else. It really help me like logistically um, or just, uh, what is really like the most effective size kind of thing. Cause early on I was like, okay, super excited. And you know, this is great. And if we could get six kids coming out, that'd be awesome. And, um, and we end up with like 14 players and I'm like, Oh, it's, you know, like, it's fine. It's me. I've got it. And that's like, a repeating theme. The, the program's more successful than you had anticipated continuously, yes. both yes. the number of schools that want to do it, number <laughs> of kids at the schools that want to do it. And so yeah. you sound like you're yeah. a little resource constraint from step to step to step and modifying and adding on oh, and yeah. modifying and playing catch up. And in learning, um, I also, you know, with all of that, you know, that first season, you have 14 players. I, I reach out to the the teacher that I, I'm close with at the school to get input on, okay, here are the players who are registered, who needs, you know, one-on-one assistance, you know? And it was interesting because she's like, oh, well, you know, this person, oh, well, he'll do great. And I think we only probably had maybe seven or eight peer buddies that first practice because she was like, oh, no, the, well, that'll be fine. That one will be fine. Um, and I, it was a little much. It was like, okay, you know, and I think the mom and me, like, I just didn't have a comfort level of, you know, we did have a couple kids who were quiet wanderers, not even like loud wanderers, but they would just kind of you know, kind of walk off. And if you weren't paying attention, you know, you wouldn't notice. So that was the learning thing for me. Um, originally I didn't pair people up beforehand. Um, and it just took a little too much time and I felt better knowing who was going to be with whom. So if I know the peer buddies and by now I know the majority of the players, uh, we had sort of an interesting turnover this year. If we've been going at it for, for four years, um, at the first elementary school I started in, most of those kids have phased out to middle school. So we had like, I have a class of eight kindergartners right now. And, and that's just a different dynamic. They've never done any sport of any kind. They're literally, this going to school just started here in DC, you know, a week ago. So they had never been at the elementary school. Um, so for me, I, I definitely now look at personality. I look at age. If I don't know kids, um, you know, we have some players who, um, are higher functioning. I have some players who, um, like I said, could wander or are, um, are runners. Um, and, all of that you have to take into account. So I plan before every season, every session, I look at who's registered as peer buddies, who do I have as players, the ones that I know. And a lot of times now, after having been at it for a while, we have a lot of um, returning peer buddies and players. So I know like, okay, well, they worked together last season. And, and there is a comfort. You know, the peer buddies ask for the players. The players ask for the peer buddies now. Like, are they... You know, is Joey going to be here today? You know, kind of thing. Um, And then another thing that I did, uh, which again, probably happened after a couple seasons, is I hired um, a couple, like I'll hire one or two high schoolers, upperclassmen high schoolers, pay them as an assistant coach to work with me. 
Um, Cause then it's like, you know, you have the players and the peer buddies, but if you have an issue or if a child, you know, gets sad and needs to sit out, either I can be the one to go and, and help them, or I have someone else who can, you know, kind of step off and, and take care of things. So that was uh, one of the things that I was like, okay, well, we've had these peer buddies come out and here's some high schoolers and wow, they're really great as a peer buddy. And then I, you know, reach out and say, Hey, um, you know, I always hire assistant coaches and, you know, I pay $20 an hour and, you know, and they're like, yes. <laughs> you know, so we, that's a, um, that's a I good actually, wage rate. It is. Well, yeah. you know, you have to be, it's only, it's only an hour a week. Uh, it, but some of them do multiple, multiple days, but, uh, had to have a draw too, you know? So, but they love it. They love it. I, uh, there's a lot of, I think, personal essays that have also come out of ODS for college, but yeah, it, it started off as just a sort of like, Oh, I'll just put them together. And then it became definitely a process of making sure that the right kind of kid was, Mm. um, paired with the right kind of peer buddy. And some of that is just personality. Like sometimes we have a quiet, player who might need a more charismatic peer buddy, um, to try to, you know, the energy level and they kind of, you know, work off of each other. Um, so some of the things I have to, you know, say to (laughs) some of the kids are kind of funny, like, you know, if you're kind of like down and (laughs) not saying anything, they kind of go off of that. Like if you start running across the field as we're doing a warm up, they're going to run with you, you know? Um, so, uh, but yeah, it's, um, it is a process. You know, you just mentioned something and it made me pause to think. You said if, if one of the children is feeling sad and needs to sit out mm-hmm. and, and looking at a lot of the videos and um, content on your website, everybody seems so happy, yeah, so engaged and so delighted to be participating in the program. Yeah. Is that an accurate observation, meaning? I would, yeah. No, I would say probably 95% of the kids that come out are happy yep. about being there. Yet, mm-hmm. would you, and, and again, this could be a biased perspective, and I could be just receiving a lot of marketing materials from your program, and maybe I'm making the inaccurate judgment, but is it, if I took a group of neurotypical kids, a hundred of them, mm-hmm. and put them in a, in a, camp program or an after school program, would they be as happy? I mean, for some reason, everybody in your program seems overjoyed. Is it, is that, is there something going on there or is it? Yeah, there's something in the water. Or is Uh, it because maybe they just don't normally get to participate in such fun things that this thing, that this opportunity is genuine and and enriching in a way that they hadn't had access to. So they're happy. Can it be as simple as that? I do think, um, I think, well, most of the kids who come out to play, um, I would say the majority of them are excited to be there. And I really think it is like, I've never been able to stay after school. I've never been able to go and, you know, my, you know, we've had a handful of families for sure that it's like, she always goes to her brother's soccer game and she's never like, now she's on her own team and she's so excited. So, you know, the majority of the kids, that play for us come in that way, excited about it. And then there's a small chunk of kids um, that, and it's happened a handful of times and it's, it's been awesome, you know, and, and that's going to sound weird, but they come in and we like, on, we like oh. weird. <laughs> Good. Weird's interesting. What do you have? That's weird. You know, a, a child who comes to play um, and wouldn't say nonverbal has autism, n- not very chatty. There's not a whole lot of engagement with their peer buddy and they stay on the outside of the field, uh, kind of, you know, sitting or wandering around the outside of the field, um, not really engaging. So, you know, in those instances, I usually tell a peer buddy like, Hey, you know, take a ball. And if they just want to sit for a while, okay. You know, like I said, we don't ever force a, a player to come out. We're not dragging anybody. Um, it's on their terms. Because I said, this may be scary for them. New routines um, are scary. And I said, I know from my experience with Hannah that she loves a routine and she finds security in it and safety in it. Um, so this is new. But 
I said, if you're just their friend, you know, sit down, talk to them, you have the ball, um, ask them about their day. And maybe they don't answer. Maybe you just have to talk to them for an hour about what you're doing and, you know, what sport you play or the, the musical you're in or whatever. I said, just be their friend and be there. And for eight weeks, he kind of was on the outside with his peer buddy, kind of checking it out. And in the last game, we always try to play a little scrimmage at the end of every session. The last scrimmage, he just comes out, puts on a penny, dribbles down, scores a goal. You know, I was like, like, this is amazing. And I talked to his mom afterwards. I was like, you know, Matthew, like he's been checking us out. Like he's been, you know, figuring out uh, what we're doing. And today he decided to play and he scored a goal, huge smile. And she's like, well, he's been telling me every day how much he loves soccer. So it was Isn't just his case. It was just what he needed um, to be comfortable. And, and it is, you know, that was, you know, pretty early on a couple of years ago. Uh, he now is, you know, he plays every season. He's now fully engaged. He's doing passing drills. You know, he might kind of do a brief wander off, but come back. Um, and he's, and he does it all and he loves it. And he was the first kid that I noticed that. And then afterwards, you know, we've had a handful of, of kids that were just like that. They, they just needed to check it out first and, and then they get a little closer or maybe they then come in and participate like in one drill or most kids love the scrimmage cause they love to, you know, be able to score in sort of that game setting. So that's always a big draw, but um, I don't think we don't have a lot of tears um, that sort of thing. The kids, and I'm not sure I do think there is a lot of, well, obviously not during COVID, a lot of high fives, a lot of you're doing awesome, a lot of, wow, that was so great. And I'm a huge cheerleader during every practice. Um, you know, I, I, you know, try to, you know, we do go through and do a lot of the same drills again, to sort of build up a confidence, build up a, a knowing what's going to happen when you come to practice, but we always do a retrieval process like, okay, Hey guys, when we're doing warm up, what do we do first? And so we work on those sorts of things. I try to tie in a little bit of also PT. Like we talk about, you know, like, well, in soccer, do you always move forward and backwards? And they're like, no, you know, like, all right, so we're going to do this relay race thing here, but we're going to hop forwards. And then I have like a skills ladder, you know, <laughs> and like, you know, all right, now we have to go lateral and sidestepping, which, you know, for, I think the, the person who's never interacted with children with special needs of any kind, like that's really hard, really hard. Um, but we work on it and they're getting it and they're improving, but like we do like the same kind of things, um, over and over again. And I think the, the fact that I'm cheering for these kids, the whole practice I reach, I tell the peer buddies, like, this is your job. Your job is to pay attention when I'm giving instructions because maybe your player missed some of it and be their friend and be their cheerleader and tell them they're doing awesome. And, you know, the smiles that you get from these kids, like, wow, that was so great. And they're, you know, um, it, it's hard, I think, not to have fun. You know, I've only had I think one, one player I can think of who just, um, you know, he really was intimidated by the idea of like competition, physical, the physical sort of competition of a soccer field or a basketball field. But he's a kid who, you know, did the adapted Taekwondo class, you know, sort of a more individual sport. Yeah, um, cool. And we also do bocce, which is awesome. Um, and at least here we have it in the high schools as a unified sport. Um, so, you know, that's something that's not quite the same physical competition. Um, but most of the kids, um, yeah, I think it's just been, a, it's, it's sort of a, a real positive, um, encouraging environment. So Sarah, early on, you had talked about the birth of, of, uh, Hannah and you said, uh, you had heard that some couples, this either makes them grow apart or makes them grow stronger. And mm -hmm. it 
my sense of your relationship with Mark is that it had you grow stronger because it seems like you guys are really uh, a team and accomplishing a lot together. I'm just curious, you having grown up as a competitive athlete, Mm -hmm. going to college to compete in sports, Mm -hmm. did that preparation, did competing as an athlete prepare you for the work that's involved in your life today and the project that you've taken on with um, Open Door Sports, is is your competitive nature and your drive for success born from your athletic experience? Probably, yeah, probably. Um, you know, um, yeah, my parents were, you know, my mom more than my dad, pretty... Um, like you gave 110% or more all the time, or why are you even out there? And it, that went from whatever sport you were playing. Did you have siblings? I had one older brother. It's so uh, interesting. My wife shares mm-hmm. that role in our family. If you sign up for something, you go to yeah. the end. If you don't want to sign up again later, that's fine. Exactly. Yeah. You're not staying home. You're going to learn how to skate, ski, swim. She... Right. Took, we had three kids in less than four years as well, and she just drove my children physically and emotionally towards involvement and success and trying yeah. hard and learning learning all those pieces. Where I, yeah. I, It sounds to me like I'm a little bit more like your dad. Right. <laughs> Meaning, just want to be supportive, but I, yeah. I didn't drive them like that. Yeah. Yeah, and it was... Um... You know, it was, it was anything, you know, it was like, you know, he was like, you know, I'm going to teach you how to change a tire or whatever, but you just, school was the same, um, you know, super high, um, expectations, but also super nurturing. Um, I maybe part of it is personality. I was the second, so I'm the youngest. Um, I just loved it. Like I, you know, I loved it all. And I think for my kids too, it was that it was like, you know, it sounds like your wife, the same sort of thing. Like you sign up, you say you want to do something, you know, I'm not going to, you know, I never push my kids to play soccer. I was, you know, like, of course, or at least here, that was what was most available. Um, you know, so as toddlers, they were all playing and, you know, I was <laughs> got pulled in to coach and, this was a, a league where they didn't um, put in any caps on uh, team numbers. So we had like 42 players in like the three to four year olds. And there were two other guys that I coached with. <laughs> After that experience, I was like, I'm not sure that's for me. Um, like maybe when we, you know, they have a little more skill or whatever. Um, but I never pushed soccer for them and they all did it. And some, you know, some took to it. Our eldest took to it. Um, and I honestly think Hannah probably is our best athlete. Uh, if she didn't have the, the brain injury, the stuff that she pulls off is it's amazing. And I know her, her physical therapists and doctors, they're just like, we're not sure how she does what she does, but, um, she's, uh, she is quite something, but yeah, I think it's, I don't know. It's just, I think a part of who I am that, that, you know, you don't have to be the best in everything, but I want you to give your best and whatever that is, I love that, you know, is, is what's important. And, um, and I, and like you follow through, if you make a commitment to something, you, you need to do it. You don't have to re up, you know, yeah, uh, that's not like me. That's to make the distinction. That's like my wife. <laughs> and and it's a, all three of our kids are in college. Our first one's graduating in a week or two. And I will oh. tell you that her um, instruction of that dedication paid off for them and is paying off for them in spades. Whether they liked it or not growing up, it's rewarded each of them individually because they know to expect what they should expect from themselves as yeah. opposed to from others. Uh, right. Tell us a little bit about Hannah today. How old is she and what is she up to? Um, she is 17. She and her twin, Libby, are 17. She's a sophomore in high school. 
um, in a, um, a program here that's called LFI learning for independence. So it's a certificate degree. She has, you know, not only the cerebral palsy, um, but an intellectual disability as well. Um, she's like sunshine. I don't even know how to like, you know, early on we realized the impact, like why she's here, you know, cause she just, she loves everybody, loves people, super infectious and, um, you know, Hannah very rarely has a bad day. She definitely, when she was younger, had some tantrums, but um, she's doing great. So she right now, um, most of the programs and things that she did before COVID are not functioning. Like Special Olympics didn't do basketball. Um, Maryland Youth Ballet, where she was in a, a, a ballet class, they didn't run their program. Horseback riding didn't happen, but ODS happened. <laughs> so it's awesome. She, yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, again, I think the beauty of being a small nonprofit, it was, you know, I coach everything um, right now, uh, six days a week. I have a, another coach doing another program, but um, you know, I could control it and I could set what we are comfortable with and control numbers and okay, everybody's wearing a mask even outside and, sanitizing things. And, you know, so for us, we kind of got back into it in July when things opened up in our County to allow for uh, certain numbers of outdoor sports gatherings. And um, so she plays right now with ODS three days a week um, and in loves it. So yeah, she's, that's, that's it. She does best buddies in high school and she played on the bocce team uh, at her high school, they did it all virtual, but yeah, she's if, a busy girl. If people want to learn more about Open Door Sports, visit their website at opendoorsports.org. And I know they have um, a link where you can donate to opendoorsports.org. And if you're listening to this and, and you're inspired by Hannah and her mom, Sarah's story, I'd encourage you to click on that link and give what you can because certainly um, the connections that are being developed through this program are uh, not only remarkable but important for, you know, a world that we want to change and make better as we can each day. And it's there's no shortage of crazy stuff going on in the world. You just need to turn on the TV. So if you want to counter that, invest in things like opendoorsports.org and you can be responsible for helping things be a little bit better. Sarah, we're super grateful for you to have taken the time to spend with us today. And uh, we'd love to check back in with you maybe in a little bit and see how the summer program went. Perfect. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Yeah, we look forward to seeing you soon. All right. Take care. On the Whistle is powered by Squad Locker. Squad Locker is your one-stop shop for customized team apparel delivered right to your front door. To learn more, visit squadlocker.com.